Hey guys, Toby Mathis here, and today we're going to dive into 20 point comparison between a living trust and a will. We're going to do basically 20 points of comparison. Uh, this was, by the way, the number one topic that you guys wanted me to address when we polled online. Uh, as always, if you go down into the comments and let us know different topics you want us to hit. Uh, and more importantly, before you actually listen to this video, if you just go down there and say what you think is better, a living trust or a will and why, that would be great. It would give us some uh, some some things that we can dive into. Speaking of diving into, let's go into the 20 points. Number one, probate avoidance. So a living trust generally avoids probate if it's properly funded, uh, while a will will put you right into the probate process uh, because it requires the judge to distribute the assets. Now, there's a third category, which is dying in test state when you have neither document that'll also put you into the probate process. But we're assuming that you're acting responsibly and you're doing some sort of documentation. So the difference between those two points is a will will require the probate process, probate process, and a living trust generally avoids it. What is the probate process? It's filing with the state uh, in which, or the county in which you're located uh, in their courts. It, sometimes it's a probate court, sometimes it's called something else, but generally you require a judge to actually distribute the assets. According to ARP, it could be 20% of a, of a small estate uh, and it could take generally about 18 months, depending on the court that you're in. Sometimes if you have a small estate, it might be much quicker. It might be three grand in three months if it's a small estate, if it's a larger estate, it could be a large percentage, uh, which we'll get into when we look at some of the statutes that actually require payment. Number two, privacy. So uh, because it's a probate process and it's in a court, it's gonna be a public document. So one of the things we've learned from like Prince and Aretha Franklin and others is that if you don't have a plan in place or if you do have a will like Michael Jackson, everything's out in the public and people can scrutinize it. Whereas if you're like Steve Jobs, you can't see anything, right? Because Steve Jobs used a living trust because it's private. When uh, when you have to go through the court process, it's all out there for everybody to see. When you don't, it's private, Larry. If you look at uh, Kobe Bryant, where there was a document that actually had to be changed, but the living trust was actually under seal. So you can't see everything uh, that's in the estate. There's only specific things that you're gonna go in there and actually interact with the court on. And that's only if there's mistakes made but it removes you from having to go through this whole uh, public documentation. I remember where I, where I in Washington state where I practiced, um, it was interesting. There was actually a thief ring going around and they were grabbing probate records and seeing what people had in their houses from the public records and hitting those houses. It's like, oh, hey, here's like a shopping list for these guys. Yeah, it is a public record. So if you don't want it to be a public record, then the living trust is your friend. Number three, when is it in effect? So a will takes, you could sign it, but it's not effective until you pass away. Whereas a living trust is effective immediately and starts to actually be something that can benefit you. I've never seen a living trust, by the way, that did not have accompanying documents like a power of attorney for financial matters, power of attorney for healthcare, distribution of certain assets, schedule of gifts, uh, certification of trust. Like there's always different documents that come with it, but these things are effective immediately. So uh, we don't know whether a will is going to, how it's effective it's going to be, whereas we, until you're passed, whereas with a living trust, it could be something that uh, it starts to be funded and, and actually gets benefit even during your lifetime if you're incapacitated, for example. Number four, ooh, number four, speaking of which, incapacitation planning. So the living trust can actually uh, allow you to manage your assets during your lifetime. In other words, if something happens to you, it has a, there's a successor trustee named, and usually like if you're married, it might be a spouse, it may be a child, it may be a professional uh, in case you're not married, or if you are and you want to have somebody else manage it, your assets can actually be covered by this living trust, even while you're alive. And if you don't understand what incapacitation planning is, holy kashmoli, uh, you do not want to go to through something like a conservatorship action. These things, these files are huge because there's so much that the court has to do. Avoid it, use that living trust, it gets it out of there. At a minimum, please use a power of attorney, but incapacitation planning definitely comes into play when we're dealing with it. Asset management. Now this is one of the benefits of a living trust too, is it allows you to put something in a vehicle to manage your assets during a lifetime, during your lifetime. But even more importantly, it's when you are passed, you still have that management in effect. In other words, it's seamless. Whereas a will, uh, you're gonna end up having to probate that puppy 
and you're going to have to have an executor appointed and management of assets is oftentimes a point of contention of who operates things, who manages things. Do they lock it all down? What access does a surviving spouse have to money? The asset management is definitely something that goes into the favor of the living trust. Flexibility. Living trusts are very flexible uh, because uh, when it comes to distributing assets, including specific uh, conditions of which somebody could receive something like, hey, only if they get a four-year degree, things like that, or staggering it out, hey, pay them 10% every year for 10 years or pay it every five years or staggering it like over ages. Hey, how about 25% distribution when you're 30, another 25% when you're 35, the rest when you're 40. You could put those types of provisions in a living trust. You can't do that in a will. Uh, and then even more importantly, things like special needs. Uh, if you put special needs provisions in that trust, then you can actually protect your beneficiaries so that if somebody is incapacitated, you don't cause them to lose certain benefits or you don't end up having the money go directly to a creditor. I, I, I can think of one case in Pennsylvania that was an unfortunate situation where somebody with special needs was bequeathed an estate from their grandparents and the state took it because they'd been supporting that child for most of their life. And they didn't realize that unless they put it in a special needs trust that the state was just going to take it. So the unwitting beneficiary of the grandparents' estate, and they thought they were doing this great thing for the grandchild, was just giving it to the state. Oops. Uh, complexity and cost. So I'm going to push this into the will. It's a little bit easier to set up. They're quite often cheap uh, because the attorneys want to probate the estate where the bureau money is made. And so they'll give you a low cost or free will. The living trust takes a little more elbow grease to get started. And there's a little more expense to it, but uh, my experience is that pales in comparison to the monies that you save and the anxiety that you avoid and the benefits that you receive during your lifetime, but even more importantly, the benefits that you give to your heirs. But definitely, when you look at complexity, this is what a lot of lawyers say is, oh, you're not wealthy enough, you're not big enough. You know, these living trusts, they're for the wealthy. No, they're for everybody. And those power of attorneys that come along with it are for everybody. Every one of us has a body. Every one of us has financial needs that we need to have met during our lifetime if we're incapacitated. If COVID taught us nothing else, you need to have advocates on the medical side and making sure that we have proper documentation. So from a complexity and cost side, I would say, hey, it's cheaper to get that will, but it's more costly. The value of that living trust is extreme because it does so many other things. How about number eight, executor versus a trustee? Executor is a uh, uh, it's something that's going to be needed when you have a will. It's going to be appointed. It's going to be court supervised. And uh, quite often there's little things like bonds and stuff like that. We'll get into that later. But the roles can be very, very different. A trustee may be somebody who's acting over a long period of time in your benefit. And it could actually be an organization. You may have a living trust that's, that's, that's around for hundreds of years. Whereas that will, it's die and distribute. That executor's in there. Quite often when you see battles, it's over the executorship because they get paid a lot of money too, depending on the state you're in. I'll get into that in a little bit. Uh, but it's an executor or a trustee. Uh, me personally, uh, uh, it's easier to act as a trustee. I've acted as trustee. I've acted as, as a power of attorney on a number of cases. I've never wanted to be in that executorship. I don't want to be underneath, uh, you know, where you're, you're having to go to court all the time. I don't like courts. Uh, property types. Um, there is a difference uh, and it really comes down to a living trust uh, is very easy for different types of assets because it's going to continue operating. So for example, if you have uh, LLCs, if you have corporations, if you have small businesses, if you have brokerage accounts, all of those real estate, uh, they all fit nicely into that living trust. And especially if you're going to continue to hold them and maybe have the proceeds paid out to beneficiaries as opposed to a will, which is not set up to do that. That's a die and distribute. Again, it comes down to uh, uh, an issue of flexibility. The living trust allows you far more options uh, when it comes to handling your estate, especially if you're uh, if you're gone. So the will only kicks in when you're passed away, whereas that living trust could could obviously come into play during your lifetime and still manage those assets. But even if we just looked at it post uh, mortem planning, that living trust is still a superior tool uh, because it allows you so much more flexibility as far as what you want, as opposed to in a will, it's die and distribute underneath the supervision of a judge. We don't want that. Or if you don't want that, then the living trust is your way to go. Number 10, 
What about out of state property? This is the dirty little secret that a lot of people don't tell you is that probates required in any state where you own real estate or where you have uh, substantial assets. And if you resided, that's, that's where you're going to be probating. So let's say that I have, uh, I reside in the state of Nevada. I have property in Washington and Texas and Georgia. Uh, guess what? I am probating in all of those jurisdictions in Nevada, Washington, Texas, and Georgia, wherever I own the real estate, I'm going to have to probate if it's in my will and it's in my name. So if you have out of state property, just having that living trust and just changing the name, which I would still use the LLC, I'd still use land trust where appropriate, things like that. But if all you're doing is, hey, I just want to not make my heirs get in the RV and call it the probate bus. If I just want them to be able to handle my estate and handle it quickly, conveniently, without having to get four different lawyers, right? Then the living trust is really your only option or at least another vehicle uh, where like, at, the, at a minimum, if you don't do anything, or even if you do an LLC or another uh, type of vehicle, you're still probating in one state. And we just want to see if we can avoid probating entirely. But out-of-state property is a huge issue. It actually happened in my family. Sometimes I share about that. We lost two, uh, two lots, just the cost of probating. Two lots in the state of Alabama was more than the value of the lots at the time. And it was one of those sad situations where something that was meant to be a gift that was going to stay in the family, it was better to let it escheat back to the, the state, let the state go ahead and take it. Um, number 11, and this is something you don't realize. It's easy to create a will, but the ease of amendment is not so easy. Uh, living trusts are just contracts. So it's easy to amend or revoke, uh, revoke during your lifetime. And it's easy to adopt it, adapt it as you go through your life. Like when I do living trusts at our firm, we oftentimes call them unlimited living trusts because we allow you to completely restate it every year. It's all included in the initial fee. Um, whereas wills require the same level of formality to, to amend them. It's called a codicil than uh, as when you first created it. So it's, it's really formal. You got to have your witnesses, depending on your state, you got to have a notary in it, depending on your state. But it, just to make an amendment, you have to go through that same thing. Whereas a living trust, it's as easy as making a change. Kind of like this. If you've ever bought property, think of it like this, the purchase and sale and amending and making little changes and scribbling on that agreement, that's a living trust. Closing is a will, right? So remember how, uh, you know, the formality that was when you went to close, that's your will. The changing of the amendment uh, on a living trust is like doing the purchase and sale. So if you've ever bought real estate, that should resonate with you. Contesting, boy, wills invite the contest. Uh, they're the frequent challenge, uh, subject of uh, challenges and contests. And the way to think of it like this is will is post-mortem planning. It's the most important witness is dead. So mom is being taken care of by her son. Her son moves next into the same town. Daughter is wildly successful out there as a business person. Uh, as a result, because mom has is taking up a lot of son's time, she makes her will 75%, 25%, 75% to son because he's there. He's caring for her during her entire lifetime. Daughter is in another state again, doing her own thing and she gets 25%. That's almost a guaranteed contest. Daughter's going to come in when mom is gone and say, you are using undue influence. That's what always happens. It's over and over and over again, ends up being a, a big old contest. Brother and sister never talk to each other again. They hate each other because it's at the end of the life and the witness that's really necessary is no longer there. Whereas in a living trust, we can make it to where daughter does that she's gone. Like she's literally disinheriting herself. So contest wise, it's those wills beg for the issue. I've seen litigation over toys that were a few dollars that were people actually going to trial on it. It's crazy. We've seen plates like really horrible Christmas plates. We saw a $5,000 motion just on one side, you know, so they spend $10,000 to divide up some plates that were worth a few hundred bucks, but it's just because of the nature of the beast. The, the will tends to get you to act your worst behavior on your worst day, whereas a living trust tries to uh, avoid it completely. Like we don't want to be in court. Number 13, uh, minors and guardianships. This is really important. So uh, if you have minor children, a will is going to trump the living trust. And why is that? Because sometimes you have to go to, you have to have something that goes into a public document. And that will is actually designed to be a public document. So 
whatever you do a living trust, you're always going to have a pour over will. This is where you put your, uh, your, your guardianship provisions or handling things for minors is you put it in that will because it's meant to go into the public. It's meant to be seen by everybody and say, this is what I intended. And that will is actually a preferred tool for that. So the will is going to win out when you're talking about minor children. Uh, and again, if you're doing a living trust, you're doing a pour over will that names the living trust as your beneficiary. That's where you're putting that in there anyway, but it is definitely better. How about bonds? Number 14, executor's bond. In many cases, when there's a will, depending on what your uh, what your relationship is with the decedent, you may have to post a bond. Whereas in the case of a living trust, we could just say that's not a requirement, right? So you could try to get away from having a bond depending on, in, like you could, you could try in, in your will, but at the end of the day, it's the court and the state law that's going to dictate. And they could say, no, we want that to be assessed. It all depends on your jurisdiction. But quite often, if you're going to be in the case of an executor, you're going to have to go down there and get bonded. And the reason being is the court can hold you responsible for anything you do, uh, which is uh, sometimes not a great feeling. Like you're going to have to go through and prove these things to the court. And you're going to have to go in there and testify. It's kind of a, a pain. It's uh, sometimes it's a little bit demeaning and depending on the court and the judge you get in front of, just think of this as they're human beings and sometimes they have good days and bad days. And the last thing you want is to be in front of a bad judge on a bad day. And if that's you, winner, winner, chicken dinner, you're getting your, you're getting that enjoyment of, 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 of having to maybe come up with a bond or maybe have to jump through a lot of hoops that you otherwise wouldn't have to. Uh, number 15, court involvement. Like again, I want to minimize court involvement, so I'm always going to go with the living trust. If you like supervision and you like having to do what the judge wants you to do and you want to go through that, then the will is uh, going to require that probate process. It's going to generally require that scrutiny of that judge. And if you like that, then a will is definitely for you. If you like going to court and you want your heirs to have to go to court and spend a bunch of time, then the will is the way. If you want to keep it private and keep it out of court, then the living trust is, is where you go. Tax planning. Now, both a living trust, this is number 16, by the way, tax planning, is both a will and a living trust do have the ability to do some tax planning, uh, but a living trust by far and away is the more sophisticated of the tools. And I'll tell you, uh, when I first started practicing, we had a, a, the uh, estate tax exclusion was $600,000 and you didn't have portability between spouses, meaning that you weren't automatically each spouse getting to use up their exclusion and you add them up. You actually had to use an AB trust to get most of the benefits. And so a living trust was actually needed at that time. It's no longer because we have laws that say there's portability, but Congress could simply do a stroke of a pen and take that away. Uh, and we don't know how long the exclusion is even going to be at the levels that they're at. We know that in 2026, things change again. So if you want to have a more sophisticated vehicle, and especially if you have a larger estate, then uh, from a tax planning standpoint, that living trust is really the way to go. How about speed of distribution, number 17? We'll just call it speed. It's not even close. Assets in a living trust can be distributed far more quickly if you want distribution. Otherwise, just passing away, I already have a successor trustee who manages the asset. It's like that, no court involvement. It's automatic. If it's a properly funded trust, you're not running through and having to jump through a bunch of hoops in a courtroom at all. You're completely private and it's completely instantaneous. A lot of times we look at it and we say, hey, during my lifetime, I'm the beneficiary and I'm the trustee, I'm incapacitated, somebody else steps into my trustee position, but the it's still the trust owning it. When I pass, still the trustee, still the trust owning it. Now there's just a new beneficiary and there might be instructions to distribute. If that's the case and I'm just distributing it to heirs, it's much quicker. We don't have to jump through the hoops. We don't have the cool down periods that often are required in those probates where like, for example, in real estate in California, I think it's six months automatic, you gotta sit on it. So if depending on the economy you're in, you may not want to sit around and wait for six months to do something. You may want to be able to handle things immediately, especially if there's things going on in a business or in the estate or in the economy. Like these are things that are real life. It makes a huge difference to not have to have those delays. The speed definitely goes to that living trust. How about revocability? It's a living trust is easy to revoke and change. We already went over the amendment, but it's very easy to, uh, to to revoke and completely redo. Uh, and it only becomes irrevocable when you have a something happen to you, like if you're incapacitated and you or 
and or you pass away, then we have irrevocability. Uh, and there are statutes designed to allow your trustee to still do what's in the best interest of the beneficiary, uh, or if they could glean what your intent was and there's something that's changed or there's a Scribner's there or something, uh, even if you screw up the entire document, there's something called a decanting where they might be able to, to, to move that trust into a new trust to achieve your objectives that you made clear in your writing. It's far better from a revocability standpoint and a changing and flexibility standpoint to use that living trust. Whereas revocability in a, in a will, it's, yeah, I can revoke it, but then there's nothing and I fall into the same situation with that, I, that I would have if I had done nothing in the first place, which is I end up in test state and I end up in, in front of that same probate. So from a revocability standpoint and a change standpoint, and even the ability to become irrevocable, but still have flexibility, it's not even close. It's a living trust. Uh, number 19, asset management continuity. Again, a living trust allows you to own an asset and it, that trust can own that asset for hundreds of years. So there can be continuity of your business, continuity of your investments and allow, let's say we just say, hey, my beneficiaries get health, education, maintenance and support. Maybe if they go to college, we help them. If you want them to travel around the world, maybe you give them a trip once a year to, to leave the country. Things like that can be inside that living trust, but the management of the asset, there's continuity of. In fact, you can even have different people acting as, as trustees of or managers over specific types of businesses or spe specific types of assets. Plus, you could actually name like an institution, a bank, if you wanted to, and just keep the management literally not even changing, depending on who passes away, who continues uh, when your descendants go on, you could have an institution doing it. You can't do that in a will. A will is a, hey, the courts is, is, is overseeing the distribution of that estate. It's going to these beneficiaries. Once that's done, they're done. There's no continuity. And what usually happens in the case of businesses, they generally do not survive a probate process, especially if the individual just didn't do documents. Maybe they did a simple will. They had their business. They were sole proprietor. That thing is gone when you're gone. There's no continuity at all. Depending on how the assets are held, you, again, you may be probating in multiple states. Once it's done, those assets are distributed. We're not managing those assets in continuity. We are literally just distributing it out and somebody's gonna do with it what they will. Usually they sell it. So management continuity, it's not even close. Again, that living trust is our friend. How about uh, number 20, executor compensation. So in a living trust, if you have a beneficiary that is, uh, uh, that is also serving in a capacity of a trustee, you could always say you get nothing, or uh, we call it being a disinterested trustee, maybe they're gonna get a reasonable compensation. And we know what trustees get paid because there's lots of institutions that act as corporate trustees. There's just about every bank has a trust department. Executor compensation is something completely different and quite often it's covered by statute. So for example, I just used two, two states just because I dealt with these things recently. Uh, California, the first $100,000, the executor is getting 4% and the lawyer's getting 4% during that probate. So 8%, so 8,000 bucks of, a, of an estate worth $1,000. We're not even talking about net, we're talking about gross. So we're looking at the gross value of an estate. Let's say you have a, a basic house in, in, in California, let's say it's 800 grand. You're paying 4% of the first 100, 3% of the next 100, 2% of the, of the, of the next 600,000. So just doing simple math on that, that's 12,000, uh, 3,000 and 4,000, 12, three and four. Let's see if I could actually have that 19,000 times two. So we're talking about $38,000 to probate that simple house in the state of California under statute. It's not much different in most states. Uh, I just pulled a case where it was a uh, fee structure. They, in, in Pennsylvania, they don't have a statute, but they follow something called Johnson Estate. And they use a, uh, basically there's a court approved amount uh, that they've already done in a, in a case that has a percentage fee that makes it reasonable. And so when you're looking at it, uh, I'm just looking at an estate between uh, 300,000, 150 to 300,000. The fee is generally gonna be, uh, in this particular case, it was $13,500. So a $300,000 house, the, uh, the, the total fee, uh, what was it? Uh, yeah, it was just over 13,500. 
Uh, so everybody says, oh, no, they're cheap. They're easy to probate. That was a house with a mortgage on it. It was a $299,000 house. And they're basically, you know, they, there's no way they're keeping that property, right? They're going to have to sell it. And they're hoping that they get enough money. The firm actually puts a lien against it. It's not a cheap process. Anybody that ever tells you that probate in my state is really cheap, it's really easy. You got a $50,000 estate. Okay, maybe as a percentage, it's it, it it's a large amount, but maybe they're saying, it's, hey, it's, it's only 3,000 bucks. It's like, come on, that's, that's, that's not cheap. You can't sit here and say that's cheap. Maybe cheap to them because because they're thinking, oh, I could have made 13,500 if you had actually be, had anything of value, right? No, it's a very expensive process. I don't ever want to deminimize the expense of having to go through that because it's uncharted waters. You're paying a lawyer 99% uh, of the time, you're having to pay somebody to do it. If you have a really small estate, you're still uncertain and you're still spending a lot of time and energy and you're still paying something. But for the most part, it's so much easier if you do these things ahead of time. You know, call, we call them anti-mortem planning before you're dead, right? Let's make sure that everything's funded into a trust during your lifetime. If you're worried, but well, I have a really small estate, buy some life insurance, dump it in there when you die, get some term policy or something so that you can make your dreams come true for your heirs and you actually have an estate. Uh, but what you don't do is do nothing. Like whenever I see those cases, especially of famous people who did literally zero, you see Prince's estate, years and years, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars of, of, of expenses that were unneeded, a whole bunch of uh, hubaloo that could have been avoided simply by having a trust. And these trusts, again, it's not just the trust, it's the power of attorney for financial matters, power of attorney for healthcare, even something as simple as uh, a, a memorandum of what you want given to individuals. Like, hey, I want my fishing rods to go to my to my buddy Ned and I want my golf clubs to go over to Michael because because he sucks and I, and I, and I, I want to torture him. Right now, it's if you want specific things to go to specific people in a will, even if you do that, it may not be enforceable depending on the state. Whereas if we just do that in a trust, it's just human beings passing things on that trustee now can read your instructions. They have control. And the beautiful part is that we can put some teeth in those trusts so that if somebody does try to come in and contest it, we can disinherit them and make it not worth their right. But the beautiful thing, the real beautiful thing is that your wishes are expressed. It's something that's living along with you that you can change as you go. And you're giving somebody the ability to step into your shoes and do what's right by your heirs or by your beneficiaries, as long as they can follow instructions. And those beneficiaries can always swap them out say, we don't like that trustee. They don't get to be put themselves in that place, but it's a fiduciary that they get to put in that place. So even if you have a horrible trustee, there's a mechanism for replacing it. So I've just found them to be far superior, but that is 20 points of difference between a living trust and a will. Hopefully you now have a much broader appreciation of the subject of what these things really are. Again, there's three ways you plan an estate, you do nothing, which is called intestate, you do a will, which you know, you're know you gonna go through probate period, or you do that living trust, in which case we're trying to avoid and minimize the probate process entirely. We still do a pour over will, like even in number three, we're, we're covering number two, never do number one, which is doing nothing. At a minimum, make sure you have that cheap will, so at least your wishes are in, in writing, but by far and away, I'm just gonna encourage anybody and everybody, to spend and, and focus their energy on getting that living trust done. And if you do it once right, you're good. You can just do a little amendments throughout your lifetime, depending on if things change, but it's so much easier for your heirs, saves you so much time. And by the way, you can actually create a really cool legacy. When you do that, I wish more people would spend time learning about this just like you did. So thank you very much for listening. If you like this content, like and subscribe and share it with anybody you care about. And now that we're all the way through, if there's other topics you want me to cover or things that you want me to clarify, by all means, put the comment, put them in the comments and I do respond. Thanks, guys.